up what's up it's your girl Brianka J and so welcome back to my channel it's book talk so why don't I read some famous short stories by some famous black authors that we should talk about I picked Kane I picked Kane you know why because John Tumor you know he was that guy I, I didn't recognize that in undergrad and it was a struggle to understand in graduate school but now that I'm doing these literary reviews and talking to y'all I'm like you know what he was slapping slapping okay so <laughs> i'm gonna read you guys blood burning moon before that i do that i'm going to um all right promote myself that's right i'm gonna outright promote myself so <laughs> here we go go to my website www.briancaj.com and check out my picture book as well as my merchandise because honey i'm bringing y'all the sauce and it's good and it's dripping all over the floor okay no seriously check it out um at my website you can find my picture book that i wrote and illustrated myself booyah and the merchandise i've made that i designed myself and it's fulfilled by amazon so you ain't got to worry about not getting your stuff or a scam and i know you got amazon prime so what you got free delivery period poo now second thing i want y'all to do is if you like it all that i'm giving go ahead and press the like comment and subscribe on this channel so your girl can get a coin okay because i'm tired of going to work i'm sleepy i just want to be free free falling sorry all right let's talk about blood burning moon now <laughs> uh read to you guys up from the skeleton stone walls, up from the writing floorboards and the solid hand honed beams of oak in the pre-war cotton factory, dusk came. Up from the dusk, the full moon came, glowing like a fired pine knot. It illuminated the great odor and soft showered the negro shanties aligned along the single street of factory town. The full moon and the great door was an omen. Negro women improvised songs against its spell. Louisa sang as she came over the crest of the hill from the white folks' kitchen. Her skin was the color of oak leaves on young trees in fall. Her breasts firm and up-pointed like ripe acorns. And her singing had the low murmur of winds and fig trees. Bob Stone, younger son of the people she worked for, loved her. By the way the world reckons things, he had won her. By measure of that warm glow which came into her mind at thought of him, he had loved her. Oh, he had won her. Tom Burwell, whom the whole town called Big Boy, also loved her. But working in the fields all day and far away from her gave him no chance to show it. Though often enough of evenings he had tried to, somehow he never got along. Strong as he was, with hands open, the axe or plow, he found it difficult to hold her, or so he thought. But the fact was that he held her to factory town more firmly than he thought, than he thought for. His black balanced and pulled against the white of stone when she thought of him. And her mind was vaguely upon them as she came over the crest of the hill, coming from the white folks' kitchen. As she sang softly at the evil face of the full moon. A strange stir was in her. Indolently, she tried to fix upon Bob or Tom as the cause of it. To meet Bob in the cane break as she was going to do an, an hour or so later was nothing new. And Tom's proposal, which she felt on its way to her, could be indefinitely put off. Separately, there was no unusual significance to either one. But for some reason, they jumbled when her eyes gazed vacantly at the rising moon. And from the jumble came the stir that was strangely within her. Her lips trembled. The slow rhythm of her song grew agitant and restless. Rusty black and tan spotted hounds lying in the dark corners of porches or prowling around backyards put their noses in the air and caught its tremor. They began plaintively, plaintively to yelp and howl. Chickens woke up and cackled. Intermittently, 
all over the countryside dogs barked and roosters crowed as if heralding a weird dawn or some ungodly awakening the women sang lustily their songs were cotton wad to step their ears louisa came down into factory town and sank wearily upon the step before her home the moon was rising towards a thick cloud bank which soon would hide it red nigger moon center blood burning moon center come out that factory door chapter two up from the deep dusk of a cleared spot on the edge of the forest a mellow glow arose and spread fan wise into the low hanging heavens and all around the air was heavy with the scent of boiling cane a large pile of cane stalks lay like ribboned shadows upon the ground. A mule harnessed to a pole trudged lazily around and round the pivot of the grinder. Beneath a swaying oil lamp, a negro alternatively whipped out the mule and fed cane stalks to the grinder. A fat boy waddled pails of fresh ground juice between the grinder and the boiling stove. Steam came from the copper boiling pan. The scent of cane came from the copper pan and drenched the forest and the hill that sloped to factory town beneath its fragrance. It drenched the man in circles seated around the stove. Some of them chewed at the white pulp of stalks, but there was no need for them to. If all they wanted was to taste the cane, one tasted it in factory town, and from factory town one could see the soft haze thrown by the glowing stove upon the low-hanging heavens. Old David Georgia stirred the thickening sir with a long ladle and ever so often drew it off. Old David Georgia tended his stove and told tales about the white folks, about moon shining and cotton picking and about sweet nigger gals to the man who sat there about his stove to listen to him. Tom Burwell chewed cane stalk and laughed with others till someone mentioned Louisa. Till someone said something about Louisa and Bob Stone, about the silk stocking she must have gotten from him. Blood ran up Tom's neck hotter than the glow that flooded from the stove. He sprang up, glared at the men and said, she's my gal. Will Manning laughed. Tom strolled over to him, yanked him up and knocked him to the ground. Several of Manning's friends got up to fight for him. Tom whipped out a long knife and would have cut them to shreds if they hadn't ducked into the woods. Tom had had enough. He nodded to old David Georgia and swung down the path to factory town. Just then the dog started barking and the roosters began to crow. Tom felt funny. Away from the fight, away from the stove, chill got to him. He shrivered. He shuddered when he saw the full moon rising toward the cloud bank. He who didn't give a, give a goddamn for the fears of old women. He forced his mind to fasten on Louisa. Bob Stone, better not be. He turned into the street and saw Louisa sitting before her home. He went towards her, ambling, touched the brim of a marvelously shaped spotted felt hat, said he wanted to say something to her and then found that he didn't know what he had to say, or if he did, that he couldn't say it. He shoved his big fist in his overalls, grinned, and started to move off. You all want me, Tom? That's what us wants, show Louisa. Well, here I am, and here I is, but that ain't helping me none, all the same. You wanted to say something? I did that show. But words is like the spots on dice. No matter how I fumble them, there's times when they just won't come. I don't know why. Seems like the love I feel for you then stole my tongue. I got it now. Wee, Louisa, honey. I oughtn't tell you. I feel I oughtn't... I oughtn't because you is young and you goes to church and I has had other gals but Louisa I sure do love you 
little gal i watched you from them first days when you all sit right here before your door before the well and song, sang sometimes in a way that like to broke my heart i carried you with me into the field day after day and after that and i show camp plow when you was here and i can show camp plow the fit there and i can pick cotton Yes, sir. Come near beating Barlow yesterday, I sure did. Yes, sir. And next year, if old Stone will trust me, I'll have a farm. My own. My bell to buy what you get from white folks now. Silk stockings and purple dresses. Of course, I don't believe what some folks been whispering as to how you get them things now. White folks always did do for niggas what they likes. And they just can't help but liking you, Louisa. Bob Stone likes you. Of course he does. But not the way folks is a whispering. Does he, hon? I don't know what you mean, Tom. Of course you don't. I've already cut two niggas. Had to, hon. To tell them so. Niggas always think of trying to make something out of nothing. And then besides, white folks ain't up to them tricks so much nowadays. Goddamn better not be. At least they're not wise not with you. Cause I wouldn't stand for it. No, sir. What would you do, Tom? Cut him just like I cut a nigga. No, Tom. I said I would and there ain't no more to it. But that ain't the talk of now. Sing, honey, Louisa. And while I'm listening to you, I'll be making love. Tom took her hand in his against the tough thickness of his own. Hers felt soft and small. His huge body slipped down to the step beside her. The full moon sank upward into the deep purple of the cloud bank. An old woman brought a light, light lighted lamp and hung it on the common well, whose bulky shadow squatted in the middle of the road, opposite Tom and Louisa. The old woman lifted the well lid, took hold of the chain, and began drawing up the heavy bucket. As she did so, she sang. Figures shifted, restless-like, between lamp and window in the front rooms of the shanties. Shadows of the figures fought each other on the gray dust of the road. Figures raised the windows and joined the old woman in song. Louisa and Tom, the whole street singing. Red nigger moon, sinner. Blood burning moon, sinner. Come out that factory door. Chapter 3 Bob Stone sauntered from his veranda out into the gloom of fir trees and magnolia. The clear white of his skin paled and the flush of his cheeks turned purple. As if to balance this outer change, his mind consciously a white man's. He passed the house with its huge open earth, which in the days of slavery was the plantation cookery. He saw Louisa bent over that hearth. He went in as a master should and took her, direct, honest, bold. None of this sneaking that he had to go through now. The contrast was repulsive to him. His family had lost the ground. Hell no, his family still owned the niggers, practically. Damned if they did, or he wouldn't have to duck around so. What would they think if they knew? His mother, his sister. He shouldn't mention them. Shouldn't think of them in this connection. There in the dusk, he blushed at doing so. Fellows about town were all right, but how about his friends up north? He could see them, incredible, repulsed. They didn't know. The thought first made him laugh. Then, with their eyes still upon him, he began to feel embarrassed. He felt the need of explaining things to them. Explain hell. They wouldn't understand. And moreover, whoever heard of a southerner getting on his knees to any Yankee or anyone? No, sir. He was going to see Louisa at night and love her. She was lovely in her way. Nigger way. What way was that? Damned if he knew. Must know. He'd known her long enough to know. Was there something about niggers that you couldn't know? Listening to them at church didn't tell you anything. Looking at them didn't tell you anything. 
talking to them didn't tell you anything unless it was gossip unless they wanted to talk of course about farming and liquor and crafts but those weren't nigger nigger was something more how much more something to be afraid of more hell no whoever heard of being afraid of a nigger tom burwell Cartwell had told him that Tom went with Louisa after she reached home. No, sir. No nigger had ever been with his girl. He like to see one try. Some position for him to be in. Him, Bob Stone, of the old Stone family, in a scrap with a nigger over a nigger girl. In the good old days, ha! Those were the days. His family had lost ground. Not so much, though. Enough for him to have cut through old Lemon's cane field by way of the woods that he might meet her. She was worth it. Beautiful nigger gal. Why nigger? Why not just gal? No, it was because she was nigger that he went to her. Sweet. The scent of boiling cane came to him. Then he saw the rich glow of the stove. He heard the voices of the men circled around it. He was about to skirt the clearing when he heard his own name mentioned. He stopped, quivering. Leaning against a tree, he listened. Bad nigga. Yes, sir, he sure is one bad nigga when he gets started. Tom Burwell has been on the gang three times for cutting men. What you think he's going to do to Bob Stone? Dunno yet. He ain't found out. When he does, <laughs> baby, ain't no telling. Young Stone ain't no quitter, and I can tell you that. Blood of the old ones in his veins. That's right, he'll scrap too. Be getting too hot for niggas around this way. Shut up, nigga. You don't know what you're talking about. Bob Stone's ears burned as though he had been holding them over the stove. Sizzling heat welled up within him. His feet felt as if they rested on red hot coals. They sung him to quick movement. He circled the fringe of the glowing. Not a twig cracked beneath his feet. He reached the path that led to Factory Town, plunged furiously down it. Halfway along, a blindness within him veered him aside. He crashed into the bordering cane break. Cane leaves cut his face and lips. He tasted blood. He threw himself down and dug his fingers in the ground. The earth was cool. Cane roots took the fever from his hands. After a long while, or so it seemed to him, the thought came to him that it must be time to see Louisa. He got to his feet and walked calmly to their meeting place. No Louisa. Tom Burwell had her. Veins in his forehead bulged and distant. Saliva moistened the dry blood on his lips. He bit down on his lips. He tasted blood. Not his own blood. Tom Burwell's blood. Bob drove through the cane and out again upon the road. A hound swung down the path before him towards factory time. Bob couldn't see it. The dog loped aside to let him pass. Bob was blind of rushing, made him stumble over it. He fell with a thud that dazed him. The hound yelped. Answering yelps came from all over the countryside. Chickens cackled, roosters crowed, heralding the bloodshot eyes of Southern Awakening. Singers in the town were silenced. They shut their windows down. Palpitant between the rooster crows, a chill hush settled upon the huddled forms of Tom and Louisa. A figure rushed from the shadow and stood before them. Tom popped to his feet. What you want? I'm Bob Stone. Yes, sir, and I'm Tom Burwell. What you want? Bob lunged at him. Tom sidestepped, caught him by the shoulder, and flung him to the ground, straddled him. Let me up! Yes, sir, and I. Yes, sir, but what you doing, Bob Stone? A few dark figures, drawn by the sound of scuffle, stood about them. Bob sprang to his feet. Fight like a man, Tom Burwell, and I'll lick you. Again, he lunged. Tom sidestepped and flung him to the ground, straddled him. Get off me, you goddamn nigga, you. Your show has started something now. Get up. Tom yanked him up and began hammering at him. Each blow sounded as if it smashed into a precious, irreplaceable, soft something. Beneath them, Bob staggered back. He reached in his pocket and whipped out a knife. 
That's my game show. Blue flash. A steel blade slashed across Bob Stone's throat. He had a Swedish sick feeling. Blood began to flow. Then he felt a sharp twitch of pain. He let his knife drop. He slapped one hand against his neck. He pressed the other on top of his head as to hold it down. He groaned. He turned and staggered towards the crest of the hill in the direction of White Town. Negroes who had seen the fight slunk into their homes and blew the lamps out. Louisa, dazed, hysterical, refused to go indoors. She slipped, crumpled, her body loosely propped against the woodwork of the well. Tom Burwell leaned against it. He seemed rooted there. Bob reached Broad Street. White man rushed up to him. He collapsed in their arms. Tom Burwell. White men, like ants upon a forge, rushed about. Except for the taut hum of their moving, all was silent. Shotguns, revolvers, rope, kerosene, torches, two high-powered cars with glaring searchlights. They came together. The taut hum rose to a low roar. Then nothing could be heard but the flop of their feet in the thick dust of the road. The moving body of their silence preceded them over the crest of the hill into factory town. It flattened the new roads beneath it. It rolled to the wall of the factory where it stopped. Tom knew what the, that they were coming. He couldn't move. And then he saw the searchlights of the two cars glaring down on him. A quick shock went through him. He stiffened. He started to run. A yell went up from the mob. Tom wheeled about and faced them. They poured down on him. They swarmed. A large man with dead white face and flabby cheeks came to him and almost jabbed a gun rattle through his guts. Hands behind you, nigga. Tom's wrists were bound. The big man shoved him to the well, burned him over it. And when the well work caved in, his body would drop to the bottom. Two deaths for a goddamn nigga. Louisa was driven back. The mob pushed in. Its pressure, its momentum was too great. Drag him to the factory. Wood and stakes already there. Tom moved in the direction indicated. But they had to drag him. They reached the great door. Too many to get in there. The mob divided and flowed around the walls to either side. The big man shoved him through the door. The mob pressed in from the sides. Taut, humming, no words. A stake was sunk into the ground. Rotting floorboards piled around it. Kerosene poured on the rotting floorboards. Tom bound to the stake. His breast was bare. Nail scratches lit little lines of blood trickled down and maddened to his in the hair. His face, his eyes were set and stony. Except for irregular breathing, one would have thought him already dead. Torches were flung into the pile. A great flare muffled in back and black smoke shot upward. The mob yelled. The mob was silent. Now Tom could be seen within the flames. Only his head erect, lean like a blackened stone, stench of burning flesh soaked the air. Tom's eyes popped. His head settled downward. The mob yelled. His yell echoed against the skeleton stone walls and sounded like a hundred yells, like a hundred mobs yelling. It yelled, thudded against the thick front and fell back. Ghost of a yell slipped through the flames and out the great door of the factory. It fluttered like a dying thing down the single street of factory town. Louisa, upon the step before her home, did not hear it. But her eyes opened slowly. They saw the full moon glowing in the great door. The full moon, an evil thing, an omen, soft showering, the homes of folks she knew. Where were they, these people? She seeing, and perhaps they'd come out and join her. Perhaps Tom Burwell would come. At any rate, the full moon and the great door was an omen, which she must sing to. Red nigger moon, sinner. Blood burning moon, sinner come out that factory door that is the story one hell of a story um hope you enjoyed it hope it inspired you to read john tumor's kane a novella and um i'll catch you guys next time make sure you like comment and subscribe peace out